Have a great day, everybody. This is Munich, Germany. We are live from the Future Forum in the BMW Welt in the headquarters of BMW here in Munich, in Germany. I wish you a great afternoon to Europe, to Africa, to the Middle East. Uh, good morning to the Americas and a great evening to Asia Pacific. My name is Sven Gaboyanski. I'm the chairman of To Be Ahead, which is the largest future research institute in Europe. And we joined forces with BMW, with the Future Forum in BMW, to bring you a series of some extraordinary talks, actually, about the next steps in humankind, the next 100 years. And today, you are going to see episode number three. If you saw episode number two, then you remember that I introduced my son. My son, uh, his name is Beneth. And uh, Beneth, you can see him here, was born in 2015. And given today's statistics, he will pass away uh, somewhere beyond 2115. So the next 100 years, talking the next 100 years, is talking the life of my son. And Bennett is not, not science fiction, I see him tonight. <laughs> he, he loves playing soccer, he loves playing uh, Pokemon Go, and some month ago he asked me to build, with him together, to build a rocket uh, to travel into, into space. And this was the reason why in our, in our previous series, in our previous episode, we were talking about exploring the space. We traveled into the year 2040 and the year 2101 uh, because these might the years when the when the first extraplanetary person visits planet earth but it's not an alien it could be the grandchild of my son so if you missed this episode watch out for it you will find it on the on the website of the future forum here at bmw and of course in youtube too today we want to jump into the year 2069, because in the year 2069, so given a study which is conducted in my institute, um, in this year, Bennett will be looking forward becoming a cyborg. Sounds a little bit scary, I know, um, but uh, the cyborg thing means he will be able to use a brain-computer interface. So today we are talking about the first cyborg. In our study, we predict that in 2069, um, so 48 years from now, it will be able to upload, to upload your brain into a computer and maybe even more to connect people's brains, different people's brains through the internet to think and to feel together. So to prove if this prediction is on track with today's front runners in this neural interface field, um, I invited one guest from Silicon Valley for today into this session. His name is Randall Köhne. You see him here. Randall is chairman of the Carbon Copies Foundation and he's a neuroscientist and he introduced um, the concept of the whole brain emulation into this world and, and even more, he is the lead architect of the scientific roadmap into this whole brain emulation. And also he uh, came up with a software. The, first, the, the name of the software is Voxa, which was used in an electron microscope, um, which did the most precise scan of a mouse brain uh, recently. You, you, you might uh, have read it, this in the, in the Nature, in this, in this Nature magazine. So, um, so to say, Randall is not only a crazy thinker, but he is <laughs> also one of the makers of the future in this field. Hi, Randall. I, I we can see you. I hope we can hear you. It's really good to have you this morning. So, uh, how is it in, in, in Bay Area now, right now? Hi, it's it's really wonderful to be here. Thanks for having me. Um, it's very early here in the Bay Area. It's uh, just barely 8 o'clock in the morning right now. It is. Thank you for, for <laughs> getting up this, this early. So um, uh, if everybody, if you, everybody, if you have questions uh, to Randall, don't be shy. Uh, put your questions in the, in the comments here. Um, I will ask uh, him in the, in the, in the Q&A afterwards your, your questions. Uh, every question which, which comes up uh, in, in your mind, uh, don't hesitate uh, to ask, and we will come back to that in a few minutes. But first of us, Randall, could you take us on a, uh, 
on a tour into the into the future. So what what will be possible in this in this 48 or maybe 50 years I mentioned, 50 years from now? Yeah. Okay. I'll get going then. And uh, by the way, I want to say thank you very, very much for inviting me back again after my uh, the last time I gave a talk at To Be Ahead. Uh, that means that I didn't completely blow it at the time. Um, it's uh, this is this is going to be a bit different. This one, uh, I, I actually find it extremely interesting to be able to uh, to speak about expectations with such a significant time horizon this time. Um, most often, I'm asked to make predictions about uh, what is possible in the next 10 or 20 years. Um, but this amount of time that we're talking about today, you know, ranging from, say, going up to 2069 or maybe 2086 is a duration that's long enough that contains the projections and expectations of most of the scientific projects and plans that exist in neuroscience today. Um, if you ask a consortium of labs what they might do in the next 65 years, that contains the entire careers of everyone in those labs, from the youngest PhD student to the oldest professor. And the next big project is only expected to take five to 10 years, uh, where multiple labs in the United States, Europe, Japan, China, India, and Russia are going to, going to be using electron microscopes to scan the complete brain of a mouse at a resolution where every pixel depicts just a few nanometers, so uh, one millionth of a millimeter. This is called the whole mouse connectome project, and the result will be the first detailed map of the circuitry of a mammal brain, so detailed that you see the little spheres, the so-called vesicles, that carry the neurotransmitters to the surface of the synapse that connect neurons and carry the signals of thought and memory. Uh, but it's also so complete then that you have a map that contains the full circuitry, the whole pathway from the beginning where information enters the brain through every stage of its processing and to the results that determine what the animal thinks and does. Now the projects that preceded this have mapped just a cubic millimeter of mouse brain. I've got two images here for two of these projects. So the one on the left is the one that mapped a cubic millimeter of mouse brain, and the one on the right shows a, you know, the map of the hemibrain, the half brain of the fruit fly Drosophila melanogaster. These two were done concurrently at different labs. Uh, the Allen Brain Institute did the mouse one, and the Genelia Research Campus did the fly version. Each one of those took about five years to do, and in the case of the cubic millimeter, five electron microscopes were running 24-7 for five years to scan and collect that map. So as you see, to look forward, we have to look back first. We have to do that in order to have a perspective, to ground ourselves in a sensible metric for our expectations. We have to understand a little bit about time and what an interval of 100 years actually represents. For example, let's remember for a moment what neuroscience, brain surgery, and computing, which are all components of our topic now, what those domains were like 100 years ago. Back then, the Spaniard and Nobel Prize laureate Santiago Ramon y Cajal and his student Rafael Lorente de Noe were exploring neurons and their outgrowth and connection. They were developing the first theories of neural activity in the brain. Only 50 years ago, David Hubel and Torsten Wiesel carried out the first circuit mapping of the visual system and its systematic neuronal layers. And the Society for Neuroscience was formed, which is today the world's preeminent organization for neuroscientists. 40 years ago, Eric Kandel, another Nobel laureate, published the principles of neuroscience. And already at that time, there was a first medical application connecting directly to signal processing in the brain uh, because the first multi-channel cochlear implants were made available for patients with congenital deafness or hearing loss. Um, only 30 years ago, the first symposium on computational neuroscience was held and the multi-layer model of the cortex was published by David von Essen. 25 years ago, the first conference and journal on neuroscientific consciousness studies began. 20 years ago, Stanislas Dehane introduced global workspace theory, the first concrete model of conscious thought and self-model. Only 15 years ago, that's when optogenetic tools were first developed that allow neurons to be activated, inactivated, and observed using high-resolution light sources. 10 years ago, the Human Connectome Project began in the US with the aim to map all connections in the brain. And about the same time, the Human Brain Project began in the European Union to attempt to build an information theoretic model of cortical brain function. Commercially, the first retinal implant, the Argus II, was approved for medical use in patients with blindness at that time. And five years ago, Karim Benkanen was able to implant false memories into a mouse brain, and David Glantzman was able to transfer a memory from one marine snail to another. At about the same time, I was involved in launching one of the first two commercial deep tech neurotechnology companies, Kernel, which at the time almost became the same company as Neuralink. There's a whole story behind why those two didn't end up being one company 
And of course, there is now that Neuralink, which is a bit more in the news because it's owned by Elon Musk. Both of these are still operating, with Kernel having decided to focus on non-invasive diagnostic brain technology, while Neuralink continues to push the envelope of implantable brain computer interfaces. So keep in mind, these things began only in 2016, so very recently. One year later, in 2017, Professor Jack Gallant demonstrated reading and reconstructing both images and videos of what experiment participants were seeing, imagining, or dreaming by combining fMRI with artificial intelligence. And in the same year, Professor Theodore Berger, Professor Dong Song, and others carried out the very first clinical experiments with patients who have memory deficits in the hippocampus, where they implanted a computational artificial neural prosthesis for the hippocampal memory encoding function and demonstrated that a significant improvement of memory function was achieved with this version of the very first deep cognitive prosthetic device. So there are three important insights that we get from this timeline that I just gave you. All of modern neuroscience is only as old as the time span that we're about to imagine projecting forward. In other words, it's reasonable to expect that at least a similar number of profound advances and paradigm changes are going to happen. The entirety of computational model building, brain circuit mapping, brain machine interfaces, neuroprosthetic devices, all of that happened in the last 30 years. Those years were launched with the incredible rise in computing technology and software, and most recently, of course, the advent of machine learning. It's not a coincidence, since the system being mapped, the brain is in essence a biological machine. And the third important insight is that the advances build very quickly on one another, which means that two leads to four and four leads to 16, 16 to 256. A clear acceleration of results and a compression of the time that's needed to complete these projects, which all of them at their onset in each case looked incredibly ambitious. Now, for good measure, because I already did this here, uh, before we run headlong into future predictions and after this brief review of neuroscience, uh, let me also situate us by taking a deep breath and taking a top level view of time as if we'd been focusing on a street corner in a map and we want to momentarily zoom out so that we can see where that corner is in the context of all of Earth. So let's just do a little bit more zooming out. Modern science and the IT era, even the industrial era, together they're only 250 to 300 years old now. Considering that, we've come a very long way, very fast. All of written human history, all the great people that we've ever heard of, anyone we can mention by name and remember, are within the most recent 5,000 to 7,000 years, coinciding with the beginning of towns and cities. 300 years of modern science is such a thin sliver of those 7,000 years. And those 7,000 years are a tiny portion of the time that modern humans have been around, which is about 200,000 years. And because 200,000 years is 40 times more than all the history that we can remember, it seems like a long time. The volcano Mount St. Helens that erupted in 1980 only for formed 40,000 years ago, so humanity has been around long enough to see mountains come and go. But by comparison, it's hard to comprehend that dinosaurs roamed between 240 and 65 million years ago, not thousands, a thousand times further back to an age when a our continents were all one big supercontinent. And even that's a tiny portion of time because the Earth is four and a half billion years old. Not million, not thousand, 4.5 million thousand years. That's a million times the span of human recorded history. Everything that happened that we learn about in history could have happened a million times since the Earth began. Time is a really weird thing in that way. And I don't want to try to think about the physics of it here. But for all of us who are persons with a subjective experience, it's very strange to contemplate that there have been billions of years with no humans at all, and that there will be many more billions of years in the future as well. Plus that I'm here now in this infinitesimal little piece of time, and that when I die, all my experience of time disappears, but it all goes on without me. Now, at a previous To Be Ahead event before the great COVID pandemic, when we still gave talks in person, I talked about the human brain as a kind of machine that generates our mind and our memories. I talked about the technologies that are involved as we learn to build an artificial version of this incredible machine to the point where it becomes possible to generate the same mind with memories and all of that in such a new brain. And a person can continue to experience living either with just a few neuroprosthetic components or with an entirely artificial brain. It's super interesting. And I highly encourage you to look up those earlier presentations. Uh, in fact, I have a few references on the last slide, but um, I can't keep repeating myself, and I really want to engage with the wonderful timeline of today's topic. So in the context of neurotechnology, what the organizers asked me to think about was, 
what we have to do so that our children can have lives that are even healthier and longer than ours. Now, neurotechnology, we're talking about brain health and, and brain capability, is subject to the same overall drives and limitations as all other endeavors. So overall, the greatest and most important condition that needs to be met so that neurotechnology can help our children is for there to be a world and society where such advances are possible and where all of our children have equal access to them. The good thing about that is that meeting the, that condition is something we all have a part to play in. You definitely don't need to be a scientist, a technologist, or an entrepreneur to contribute there. And it's only a society that is socially healthy, economically healthy, and ecologically healthy that has the luxury to devote its resources and efforts toward cutting edge biomedical technology. Those supports were all in place for the timeline that I just reviewed. So for those projects that have been completed, all past and ongoing big projects depend and depended on science being conducted at an international level and on the political and economic infrastructure that that requires. So if anyone asks me which potential failure modes I worry about the most, because I think that they have the highest likelihood of causing negative disruption, it's those fundamental requirements where all of society is the supply chain to our advancements. For large companies, as well as for startups, there are some responsibilities there that may not have been acknowledged in the time of our great grandparents when, you know, when railroad and oil barons were the leadership of economies. Those responsibilities can't be ignored right now. It's outside of my field of expertise, but I suspect that we still have some difficult and essential development ahead in order to overcome the problem where, you know, the concept of being guided in a large degree by the quarterly demands of shareholders and hence the invisible hand of Adam Smith isn't actually the equation that was designed to produce the most desirable outcome for all of our children in all corners of society. But let's switch to a much smaller circle. Brain health and the neurotechnology of longer living is similar in many ways to other areas in health and medicine. You have the first goal, which is to avoid illness and dysfunction. And then if illness or dysfunction happen anyway, then you have the goal of cure or management. To keep your mind healthy, they're collections of well-understood essentials. I think that in the next few years, in fact, many of those are going to become, they're going to be given a lot more attention in a more systematic way. So for example, you know, let's talk about the fact that your brain is a biological machine, an information processor of sorts, and its circuits need to support, they need to be supported in the form of reliable oxygen supply, energy, micronutrients that are components of neurotransmitters, and a stable circadian rhythm with predictable and sufficient periods of sleep. All of the ingredients are available to us and the recipe is not a secret, although we do have to start teaching that recipe in the same way that we teach writing and mathematics. The part about sleep isn't just something to brush aside. In recent years, we've learned that the phases of sleep play an essential role in the consolidation and integration of your memory. You could say that it's the time when the database operators of your mind determine which new experiences that were temporarily encoded through the hippocampus are significant and stand out above the 24 seven noise of the day's data. They give attention to those and make sure that they are properly filed away in a manner that fits your earlier memories without erasing those. That said, when you're not sleeping, there is a place where stimulants can play a positive role. We already know that coffee has anti-inflammatory and cancer fighting properties, which is great for the whole body. On top of that, the occasional stimulant when properly chosen and combined with neuroprotectants can help keep the mind young by improving memory recall, new learning, and elevating mood, and thereby increasing the openness to new experiences. I might even go so far as to say that um, there are earlier versions of what has been depicted in film as, say, the limitless pill. In particular, the compound known as armodafinil appears to promote improved memory learning, response times, and decision making without the significant downsides of classical stimulants uh, like the amphetamines that are in Adderall and Ritalin. Now, I'm not advocating a specific regimen, of course, because I'm not a physician. I'm talking here only about the brain circuit effects and my belief that in the years to come, it will be part of a normal routine and of our progression through life to include both support nutrients, but also neural stimulants and protectants in a healthy systematic regimen, just like we made it the norm to brush our teeth with fluoride. To address brain disease and dysfunction when it does happen, there are other comp components that we have to ensure here. Most importantly, we need to notice when such problems begin to occur. The earlier, the better. Monitoring and diagnostics for the brain will become as normal as they are for the body. Just like you weigh yourself, check your blood pressure, get blood diagnostics and a physical exam, 
brain diagnostic methods better than what's now in a hospital are coming to the home user in the next few years. The treatments available will move away from the crude and system-wide impact of drugs and surgical excisions to targeted correction or support for specific functional brain circuits. To give you an example, up to now, the ways to treat epilepsy are to either attempt to control and suppress seizures with drugs like lorazepam or many, many others, or in severe cases, to apply surgical lesions, that's cutting in the brain, disconnecting or removing small portions of the brain tissue that are identified by electrode recording as the, the active origin of the seizures. But new approaches, like the NeuroPACE device, they instead target the circuit activity that results in seizure. They introduce signals formulated to suit neural signaling involved. They detect the onset of problematic brain activity before a seizure even becomes apparent, and they guide it to rest. That's an extremely early example of neurotechnology working according to the principles of what we now begin to understand about the neural code and neural systems. You can easily imagine just how far that can go because every brain dysfunction, but also every psychiatric or psychological clinical distress is experienced entirely through the orchestrated activity of neural circuits. So brain machine interfaces that speak the language of the neural code can intercede in a way that is focused, brief, not you know lasting for hours and hours like drugs, but can be right there in that moment, and natural to the brain system context. Now, as it stands, neuroscience, neurotechnology, and neuromedicine are all on the cusp of entering explosive development because foundational understanding has reached the point where the design of methods or devices that interact in a very specific way with the signals in brain circuits are possible and they've been shown in practical demonstration or minimum viable product. What we've looked at so far in this talk is relatively tame because it all falls within the confines of brain function and mental experience that we're already accustomed to. The possibilities beyond that lead into a world much more unusual. To see why, we have to first acknowledge the limitations that all generations up to now have had to work with. We're used to thinking that the world around us is as we experience it, that reality is exactly what we can perceive. And of course, that has to be how the experience seems to us because it's the only experience we can have. Okay, so I could go off on a tangent here, but don't worry, I'm not going to go off on a solipsist philosophy journey, but let's recognize this. Dogs, for instance, can clearly hear and smell things that we can't. Although they only see in shades of gray, their world must look quite different. And the same is true for birds that can sense the Earth's magnetic field or snakes that see in infrared and hear through vibrations in the soil. And if we go even further out on a limb, Detectors in Antarctica that pick up neutrinos that fly almost unhindered through entire planets perceive a ghostly universe that we have no way of seeing. But it's not just sensors that divide us from actual reality. It's normal to think that our memories are a kind of representation of some sort of the past as it was, like a photo, an audio recording, or a video. But this is completely untrue, and it's the reason why a subjective report is not often usable as scientific data, and why witnesses are often mistaken. Incoming sensory data means nothing by itself. Meaning, all meaning, only exists within a context. For example, Chinese glyphs have no meaning to me unless there is something that can translate them into the context of a language and culture that I've learned to be familiar with. The perceptual parts of our brains are constantly composing sensory data into patterns, but it's not a one-way street. At the same time, memory that is the collection of the experience of our life is feeding back to compare and contrast. The patterns established in the connections between neurons of the brain are the only patterns that can activate in response to the processed sensory data. And learning new patterns is comparatively hard. It needs a lot of repetition, much of which happens during reactivation in sleep, actually. And it becomes harder the older and wiser the system is, because it's already full of strongly established patterns. So you can see it's no wonder that the music that our children think is wonderful can simultaneously sound awful to us because we just don't have the right patterns to match that. The reality of the world that we can recognize consists only of those things that we learn to expect. So my memories of yesterday are not at all true representation of conditions around me at each moment of that day. Instead, they're a somewhat plausible construct based on my learned expectations of what would have been assumed to be going on 
dotted with pinpoints that were marked by my attention. What's worse, the only judge as to whether my recollection is plausible, likely, or correct is my own brain, the same system that was used to reconstruct those memories. So not exactly an unbiased judge. And let's go even further. Now, I'll have a quick sip here. So on account of the very mechanisms that enable my biological computing device, my brain, to work, there are aspects of reality that I could never experience and respond to, no matter how good my memory or how vast my sensory array. My neurons and synapses will never respond faster than 100 or at most 1,000 times per second. And those are the extremes. Normally, it's much slower. What this means is that to me, one tenth and perhaps sometimes one one hundredth of a second is the clock speed at which the world works. I'm obligated to completely ignore everything that is happening at time scales smaller than a millisecond. Every laptop computer or iPhone would laugh at that because it's so slow. This reality is even becoming a bit problematic now because the rate of information in the world has increased a lot. And it's quickly getting to the point where only artificial intelligence can make sense of it, make decisions, and take action. In other words, AI is taking control. On the other end of the spectrum, I'm just as incapable of integrating events that happen over long time scales because my working memory is short and it does not integrate well over those scales. Nowadays, when I give talks that are a little bit different than this one, talks that are about my work on whole brain emulation and the notion of mind uploading, I've begun to steer away from that myopic focus that is always about individual digital life or individual life extension because it ignores the much bigger questions that I hope these technologies can help us address as a society and as a culture. As I mentioned, our brains are built for a limited context of reality and the combination of our technology and social infrastructure is quickly leading to a place where the level of complexity and the rate of change, especially in our children's time, is such that only an artificial intelligence can deal with it in real time. It can do that because the information processing system that it relies on is a system that can be upgraded and expanded continually. Now, within the lifetime of our children, that situation produces a reality in which it's not human involvement, human judgment, or human leadership that shapes the overall behavior of the ecosystem of intelligences that we live in that make decisions and control the directions which we grow in. Instead, the dominant intelligence in that ecosystem is likely to become increasingly artificial. And then the question that we should think about for our children is just how artificial or what kind of artificial, artificial intelligence should that be? Should it be a more alien artificial intelligence, like the, the de novo AI that is produced by by seeding a multitude of deep learning and reinforcement learning nets on the internet? Or should it be an artificial upgrade of intelligence that's based on the evolved human mind? The latter means that we have to uplift the human mind to coordinate faster and better with greater comprehension in more contexts. Brain computer interfaces are a halfway attempt to bootstrap something like that. Using such interfaces, it's not immediately clear how the biological mind should actually interact to elevate it. Um, although I do believe that experiences with BCI will deliver a much better understanding of the problem. Ultimately, Darwinism and evolution always favor adaptability. Neuroprosthetics, then whole brain emulation and the option of mind uploading offer a path with a chance to achieve the same adaptability through upgrade that AI benefits from. So as such, it's a long-term trajectory that human culture and society can choose to take in order to overcome limitations of all kinds. If our children become adopters on that path, then they can understand a reality that we were blind to. They may come to wonder how we could be so silly to be so focused on tiny grievances about minute differences between in-group and out-group, artificial lines between countries, how we could ignore the humanity of so many who are just like us and choose to invest our time and capital in meaningless statements that don't last instead of reaching out to the vast mysteries around us. Of course, they won't wonder because they'll be smarter than we are and they will understand where we came from. And that is in fact all that I have for you today, but there is more if you're interested. So if you do want to read more and learn more about this, if you, especially if you want to learn 
a lot about the technical details of where to go with whole brain emulation, where we go beyond, say, mapping the cubic millimeter of the mouse brain and the and the brain, the uh, human connectome project, and all that towards whole brain emulation. Then I, I suggest that you look up these sites, the Allen Institute, Genalia.org, and SFN is the Society for Neuroscience. Uh, of course, come to our site, carboncopies.org as well, and to the brainpreservation.org site. And then I also heartily recommend that you read these two books by friends of mine. Um, there is a taxonomy of metaphysics of mind uploading. And of course, there's also the um, fun to read, but sometimes a little bit scary book called The Age of M. I, I should say that uh, it's, it's extremely interesting to see what Robin Hansen has thought of there, but personally, the part that makes it not a great prediction of the future to me is that it completely left out artificial intelligence. It only has whole brain emulation in it. Anyhow, these are some good, uh, good follow-up references that you could uh, check out. Thank you so much for having me here, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Randall. Thank you so, so much. So if you have questions uh, for Randall, please use the, use the comments here on, on the channel. Um, I will get it on the screen, and then uh, I will ask Randall. Um, Randall, in, the, in our last episode here in these, in these future talks uh, on the next uh, 100 years, um, we, we talked about exploring the space and, and how geneticists, in the, in, the, in the last meeting we, ha we had a geneticist, and how geneticists want to manipulate the human genome in order to adapt the human body to, to, to an environments in space and so on. And, and, and we talked about, we both, and, and you said to me, um, what the heck are they doing there? Because um, they, they, don't have to, they, have, they don't have to manipulate the human genome. Uh, space travel will work without human bodies. This is what you said. Mm. Uh, could you explain that? Uh, because this is, or, or could, you <coughs> could, you, could, you, could you place that somehow on the, on the timeline of whole brain emulation? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, <laughs> I don't want to speak ill of people who want to do wonderful things with uh, gene therapy or genetic manipulation. But um, in all honesty, trying to convert a biological organism that is meant to live in this atmosphere, in basically this biome that we have here, to live in space where there is no oxygen and where there is harsh radiation and all of those things, that's incredibly hard. And, and who knows what side effects it has to try to change one organism from that to another. Um, it seems a little strange to do that because, you know, the biology that we have here simply wasn't evolved for that environment. Um, I think it, in a sense, it makes more sense that you would want something that already has a body that is perfectly fine in the environment out there to explore space. And that's what we see today, right? We see that, um, you know, notwithstanding Elon Musk's plans for Mars, that, uh, that pretty much everything out there, all of our explorers are robots. We send robots everywhere because their bodies are perfectly suited to that environment. And so I would be extremely surprised. Let's say we met aliens tomorrow, uh, space traveling aliens who came here and had, they had to travel for a thousand years. So they somehow had to bridge that amount of time and they had to go through space and they had to make do without water and without oxygen or they had to bring it all with them. It seems more likely that we would run into aliens that actually are already beyond the point where we're at, who have developed mind uploading and who can move from one physical instantiation to another while still having a mind that you know has their culture behind it. That seems much more likely to me. So I think that all the aliens we would meet are basically going to be uploads. Okay, but let's let's not talk about aliens. Let's talk about us, about about, about the humankind. Um, uh, what what do you think? So, what what year are we talking about? Uh, my son turned six to six years two weeks ago. Yeah. Um, so. Can he, he use that, the whole brain emulation? Can, can, can he copy his, his, I don't know, his mind, his consciousness, whatever, into a computer in his lifespan? I hope so, because I think the time span that we're talking about here is long enough. Um, so first of all, I think that you, know, you, can do, you can do something a little bit similar when, you're, when where you're going is fairly close. You could have, say, a, you know, a, a BCI connection to a robot that's on, on Mars, but then you have this delay, this constant delay makes it very strange. Um, but yeah, it, mind uploading, when we get there, is going to be the way to travel through space 
uh, I think, especially for longer journeys. And when people ask me how long it's going to take to get to the point where we can do mind uploading, you know, my general take, given this is why I did this whole rundown of, you know, what is what is the time and what can we actually expect? Like, how should we look at the time spans when you consider that all of computational neuroscience happened in the last 30 years? Um, you know, it's I can look at the next projects that are coming up and I can say, well, I'd be super surprised if we got human mind uploading within the next 20 years. That seems extremely short how fast, how we could get there that fast, I don't know. But at the same time, if we're talking about 2086 or even further, when you're talking about, you know, he's, he may live until 2115, in this time span, I think given the way that things have developed so far and, and what we've shown in terms of how, you know, progress accelerates, that there's a very good chance that mind uploading will happen and that he can benefit from that. Um, you know, if we don't get there, then something must have gone wrong. And and like I said, the thing I worry about the most is that basically all of that support chain, that supply chain that makes that possible, that something breaks down there because, you know, the world isn't working the way it's supposed to or something like that. Mm. Okay, let's let's take your picture and B Bennett uh, will be uploading his brain. Um, <clears throat> but what happens then? Um, so do we have two Bennett's then? <laughs> Uh, uh, or will he have to shut down one and, and, and decide for, for, for the other? Or, or do we have two which develops in a d develop in a different way? Or, or w w what is your picture? I, 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 I know this is, this is l very much guessing, but, but from, mm -hmm. your, from the te technical point of view, which, which you are expert for, uh, how does it work? Okay, so let's be practical and talk about the actual technical approach. The, the most feasible approach, the one where you can actually see the technology developing to the point where you can tackle a whole human brain, it's not what Ted Berger is doing right now with the implantables because it, it's very hard to map all of the neurons and it's very hard to capture the behavior of all neurons over the entire lifespan of what they might, the patterns they might have gone through. So it's actually the procedure where you would scan the brain tissue just like we did for the, the, the cubic mouse brain um, and then recreate function from structure by identifying the neurons and the synapses and the neurotransmitters that are there and developing the models that then create a brain that works. So this obviously means that you don't end up with two people because you know you've you've used up the biological brain in the process of making the other one. So that's that's the first thing to realize is when we talk about this that you know the uploading you see in a science fiction movie where you know someone gets copied and and they're still there or something that that's not very likely of course the same question that you asked is still true afterwards because once you have you know one digital version of yourself uh you could make as many copies as you want right and then the question is well who's the real one or are they all the same do they all stay in synchrony somehow do they grow apart do they branch there's actually a reason i think that's very useful to read uh the work that uh, keith wiley wrote the the book uh that, that i put in the end there but also work by Mike Cerullo, which is about branching identity. Um, some of the things we're going to have to get used to is thinking about personal identity in ways that we haven't so far done. Uh, because when you think about the, the existence of a person after a copy has been made, after somebody has uploaded or after the upload has copied further, well, each of these have the same root, right? So they, have, they share the same root. They have all the same experiences. There's nothing different there. So they're all the same person in that respect. So looking backwards in time, before that branch point, they're the same person. But as soon as you go past that branch point and you have different experiences, then you become slightly more different people and, and so on. It's uh, not something that really exists right now. So, I mean, except maybe for, you know, patients who have had their, uh, uh, you know, they sort of their, their brain cut and now they're sort of the two parts of their brain are developing separate personalities over time. That does exist and is an interesting phenomenon. But um, yeah, apart from those clinical cases, we don't really have this experience yet of branching. I, I understand. So let, let me ask a, a, a quite stupid question from a from a from a person who is not who is not really uh, this person is me, of course. <laughs> it's not not in our audience. It's me, <laughs> the, the the stupid person, um, uh, who who is not who is not really deep in in, in neurosciences and and so on. If if you are talk about uh, copying a mind, so um, uh, from from my point of view, we are talking about copying. Uh, 
uh, knowledge, we're copying experiences, we are copying mm. thoughts, maybe con consciousness. Um, so uh, how, how is it? Is it, is it? is it just to, to physically uh, make a copy of the thing you can scan here and you, you, you build it on the a, on a, on a same level and, and it works? Or do you have to copy more? Is, 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 my, is my experience more than, than uh, one, a one to one copy of, of the physical thing I have here? Oh yeah, it would be it would be a great simplification to think that uh, that everything outside of the brain doesn't matter. That's not true. Uh, you know, even the way our brains work is completely integrated with the bodies that we grew up in. It's it's embodiment. Embodied cognition is is a real thing. Um, not that you can't change your embodiment. You know, you know, people can lose limbs and not suddenly be not the same person anymore, or they can. Uh, adopt a new limb, like become a really good um, kayaker or bicyclist who feels like that thing is just an extension of themselves. So it's possible to modify your, your physical body and how it works with your brain a bit. But of course, that matters a lot. So there is more to it. Um, but apart from that, the, the general gist of what you said, which is that, you know, you regard the mind as being something that is emergent from the processes of this material thing that is the brain that is the underlying philosophy and that is also the underlying concept the idea that there is a a place where you can make an abstraction um, that you can say uh, below this level all the things that happen below that level are things that aren't really part of our experience of being you know i i personally don't have any idea which neuron in my brain is firing right now and I don't experience which neurotransmitter is being the messenger for something. So for all I care, you could replace all my AMPAs with NMDAs and all my NMDAs with AMPAs, and it'd be just fine as long as I still bring the same messages because the receptors also changed or something. That's irrelevant. So all this lower level stuff, it's part of how the machine works, just like you know, our, our computers have transistors, but if we wanted to do them with relays or with uh, cathode ray tubes or whatever, that would work too. And the idea is you can find a level where what we consider human experience, where cognition happens, and that's the part that you want to abstract. That's the part you have to understand enough about to say this is where you get the same outcome when you when you run this on another platform. And yeah, that uh, it's not easy, of course. <laughs> <laughs> of course not. We we have yeah. uh, a long way to go, but but one hundred years are a long time, uh, also. So exactly. Uh, yeah. We we are we are talking. So when we when we discussing this this uh, this uh, human brain emulation and so on, um, we, we are focusing on one human, on on one human individual. Um, but mm -hmm. um, many people I'm talking to as a as a futurist um, and and future 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 thinking people they, they tell me that uh, the next next level of uh, of all these uh, neuroscience uh, uh, developments will be to connect different human brains so so can we use this technology to connect because they say we, we have the internet and the internet connected to computers and then we have the internet of things it connected the the machines and and now the, the the next level would be to connect the brains because this is this is probably yep. uh, a, a bigger step for for humankind than than the machines and the, and the computers is is it possible from your point of view well there's nothing intrinsically impossible about it um you can certainly connect brains we already do it's just that the channels we're using right now are are through our senses right but they're connected. It's not like they're not interacting. What does connection mean? Connection means two things that are able to interact, that they're that are not unable to interact. So we have connection. It's just that you can make a more direct connection. You can create connections directly between the activity of neurons or groups of neurons in a brain with another group of neurons in another brain. And what you can do with that then depends a lot on how well you understand the neural code or how things are embedded in a particular brain. Because what does it mean in this brain that a certain pattern of neurons is activated compared to what's happening in this other brain? If you want to transfer knowledge, which, you know, I mentioned some of the very first attempts to do that, like when, you know, when Glantzman transferred a memory from one snail to another, in that case, it was very easy because it was a very simple connection that is really the same between each of those. So if you know that when this is strengthened, that means this, if I can strengthen this over here, it'll mean something like that too. The context is the same, but you know, the, the Neo Matrix style downloading of knowledge is, is harder. 
um, but not impossible if you have a translator, just like that translation of Chinese glyphs to something I understand. And the same way I can imagine that as we learn more, as we, as we really begin to understand at every level how, how the mind works and how it's based on the underlying activity of the brain, that you can then create connections between people that are more intimate and more, I guess, have a higher bandwidth than what we currently have. So you could perhaps achieve a quicker understanding of, say, the, um, the, the, the sensation someone is having right now or their goals or what they really mean. Like, you know, when you're wondering, oh, did they just mean that or did they just mean that? Um, maybe you don't have to wonder anymore because you can get a signal that tells you exactly, oh, it, it was actually this. So I think that's it's possible to make a better and more you know, interesting connection uh, this way. Of course, yeah. it goes very far in science fiction, right? You have the concept of hive minds where people just feel and think all of each other's thoughts and, and then they feel this very alone if they're not in the hive mind, of course. Yeah. <laughs> but th this, would, this would, on the one hand, this, this would, uh, from my point of view, it, it would increase our, our perception of, 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 of humanity uh, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a really new level. On the, on the other hand, of course, there is the, the danger of... of Manipulation. So this technology in the hands of a, yeah. of a dictator and or or uh, he, who could change my my mind or my, or myself or 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 even only in the in the in the hand of the majority of people who could change <laughs> the, the minds of the of the minorities. So this is this is this is strange to to think about. And this this brings me back to the uh, to a, to a question from from the audience um, uh, about 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 your perception of. Indiv individuality. So, does it all, all the things uh, who, from the technical point, which from the technical point could be possible in the future, in the next in the next one hundred years, will they will they erase our our perception of individuality, or or will there be a button to 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 choose now? Now I want to be connected, <laughs> and, and, and 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 then I press mm -hmm. the button, and I'm not connected. I'm individual. W what is your your perception? What is your take on that? Yeah, if I have to guess, I would say that it's going to both happen. Uh, just like people, you know, people don't always make the same decisions. As long as we assume that there is a choice involved, that it's not, you know, mandated by someone exactly which way technology goes, then you're going to see different choices. Just like the Amish decided that, you know, technology in 18 something was exactly perfect, was exactly what God intended, and therefore they stuck with that. Um, we, you know, some people are going to choose to become more individualistic. They might decide that they just want to live in their own virtual reality in which the entire world revolves around them. And that's it. That could happen. At the same time, I mean, it's not that much different than, say, a gamer who spends 12 hours just in a game themselves. But it's it's a little, <laughs> maybe one level further. Yeah. And then you could have the other side where people decide that they want to grow as close as possible. You know, just like they, they love to hang on the so hang around the social media right now and know everything the other person is doing and keep clicking update on what is their neighbor doing. Maybe they want to be very closely connected and always feel what this person's feeling and be, be a hive mind of sorts. So you can imagine that once you have the choice that you can go both ways. And that's what I think is going to happen. And not just for that example, but for every other example of where you can make a change, where you can decide that, oh, I want this upgrade or I don't want this upgrade or I want this difference or that difference or this is how I want my version of uploading to be. And you'll have this Cambrian explosion in a sense of different ways that people decide to develop or groups of people decide to develop. Hmm. Last question from the from the audience. Uh, will there be the option to shut down my second digital con consciousness cons and uh, to die a second death, so to say? So by option, do you mean does I, I don't remember? I don't quite know. I'm going to assume that the that the person writing the question didn't mean do you get to decide if we turn off that digital consciousness, but rather does the digital consciousness themselves have a choice mm -hmm. in how long they live? Um, because that sounds just, you know, more like humane in a way. Um, I, I would say yes, but you know, we're not the lawmakers. We're, we're talking about the technology here. We're not talking about which direction society takes. Just like today we talk about is euthanasia okay, right? Some countries say yes, some countries say no. 
I can imagine that it, there is still, you know, a, a social and legal process to go through to make sure that people have the right to choose exactly how they use this technology and how they live from here on. I personally would find it really troubling if someone told me, well, you, you cannot turn this off. Your backups have to be kept. And if, if you, you know, if you do something to yourself so that your, your brain doesn't work anymore, then we have to reinstantiate a backup. And you have to keep going forever. Um, that's not very nice because, you know, part of the reason to upload was to have a choice about the time of your demise. It's, it's just, it's not immortality. There is no immortality because nothing can keep you going forever, but maybe you have more choice about how long you would like to keep on going, but that also includes being allowed to choose to stop. But that's my personal view. I don't know which way laws are really going to go. And the interesting thing is that uh, our kids probably will, will will have to decide on that if it's true that in, in the lifespan yeah. of our kids this will become reality. So thank you so much, Randall. This is uh, it, it, it was a it was great insights and and great food for thought. Um, and the the thing you mentioned in your in your talk that um, it's not not only about uh, brain emulation, but but maybe maybe even more. It's about it's about the future of. Uh, of, of AI, of, of super intelligence, mm -hmm. and uh, to, yeah. to enhance the, the human brain with uh, artificial intelligence. This brings me um, to our next talk. Next week, next Monday, 5 p.m. Uh, Central European time, we will be talking about the future of super intelligence and uh, not only the, the boring things in, in, in or let's say, in, not boring, but the, the, the normal things in future intelligence, but the question, will we, humankind will we be falling in love with ai bots and for this question i invited one of the best known science fiction authors from the world um, his name is david brin probably you know him if you if you if you love science fiction then then you of course you you know him and if you love love his books or if you love the question will you be falling or your kids will be falling in love with ai then Tune in next Monday, May 3rd, 5 p.m. Central European time, live here from the Future Forum in BMW Welt. So thanks for joining us today. Um, all my best from Munich in Germany. See you next week. Stay tuned and have a great future. Thank you.